My name is Susan Harmon Swartz. I'm a very proud member of our local second generation group. This is a local group of children of Holocaust survivors committed to preserving the memories, spreading the moral and historical lessons of the Holocaust, and sometimes sharing among ourselves what occasionally becomes just plain necessary gallows humor. I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Kurt Marburg to present a commemoration of the 40th anniversary of the Vonsi Conference. Mr. Marburg is a U.S. Army veteran who served during the Second World War. He saw horrific things. Six of his family members died in the Holocaust. Since then, Mr. Marburg has dedicated much of his life's work to enshrining the past. He speaks about the Holocaust at schools throughout both Manatee and Sarasota counties. Mr. Marburg was born in Berlin. His father was the managing director of the Berlin branch of an international real estate company. He worked with the Arnold Brothers, a prominent banking firm, which then was the leading financial center of Germany. Mr. Marburg's family developed a social relationship with the Arnold family. During this time, the Marburgs visited the Arnolds. Mr. Kurt Marburg glanced into the conference room at one point. There was an enormous mahogany table, so unique, its gravitas so distinct, that it created a lasting impression on him. Eventually, of course, the Nazis kicked the Arnolds out of their home, dispossessed them of everything they owned, and transformed that mansion into a recreation entertainment facility for high-ranking party members. Ultimately, Mr. Marburg learned that it was at this very table that he had seen that on January 20th, 1942, the Nazis arrived at what we all know today was the final solution. The 15 individuals at that table were educated. Eight, more than half of them, were lawyers. They represented the justice system. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kurt Barber. Thank you, Mrs. Susan Swartz, for your kind and warm words of introduction. I wish to take a moment to acknowledge the noted persons whose in invaluable contribution made my conceptualization for this presentation a demonstrable reality. Rabbi Joel Mishkin for total support and encouragement. Mr. Martin Peru for valuable direction and guidance. Mrs. Elaine Hurwitz Tedesco for tireless computerization, typing, advertising, telephone communication, time pressures, and personal idiosyncrasies. <laughs> Ms. Sarah Ida Tedesco, the picture projectionist. <clears throat> Mrs. Rhea Bonden Hendricks, for required national and international documentation. Mr. and Mrs. Heiko and Molly Zimmermann of Berlin, for picture series of the Wanzig Mansion. Mr. and Mrs. Herbert Ingrid Holzberg of Hannover for historic and present documentation. And Mrs. Charlotte Bartlock Marburg for relentless patience and energetic moral support during stressful moments. Mr. and Mrs. Frank and Swinda Carbone of New York for local pictures. And last but not least, my friend, George Stout, for community-wide publicity. Anna Clergy, Board of Directors, Holocaust survivors, second-generation Holocaust survivors, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. The Wannsee Conference, January 20th, 1942. The Wiesenthal Center unveiled a hate-filled letter on June 8, 2011, written by Adolf Hitler 
which is the earliest documentation of his intrinsic anti-Semitism. His four-page missive was written at the end of World War I while serving as a soldier in Munich. He had been ordered to help another soldier understand why Jews were a serious growing problem. Hitler in 1919 stated categorically, I quote, Jews are definitely a racial and not a religious group. The result of which is that a non-German race lives among us with its own culture, thoughts and aspirations, having all the same rights as we Germans have. End of quote. Hitler concluded in his letter with a message that portends that portended his future atrocities. The final goal must be the extinction of the Jews. Only a ruthless dictatorship can accomplish this ultimate mission. After forming the National Socialist Party, which we know as the Nazis, in 1920, and an unsuccessful takeover of the German government in 1923 led to a prison sentence. Hitler wrote, Mein Kampf, translates as my struggle, at the Landsberg prison. In flaming racist anti-Semitism, Hitler asserted the best and fittest and most desirable race was the Nordic Aryan German master race. Judaism was the worst, corrupt and undesirable race of all. The German people must eliminate this Jewish menace. Hitler's leadership and his book Mein Kampf affirmed the Nazis would do so. On January 30th, 1933, President von Hindenburg appointed Hitler Chancellor of Germany resulting from fraudulent and manipulated election results. I had witnessed the torch parade through Berlin after his inauguration. Terror, the most desirable effective method of this Nazi dictatorship in their efforts to persecute Jews, communists, and anti-Nazi political organizations, emerged within one month of taking office. On the night of February 27, 1933, the Reichstag, the lower house of parliament, was set on fire. Jews and communists were led to mass arrests and executions. It is believed that the Nazis set the fire themselves, using it as a pretext to crack down on their political enemies. On April 1, 1933, the Nazi government institutes the first boycott of Jewish lawyers, doctors, and merchants. Party members station themselves in front of Jewish businesses, preventing patrons from entering. On May 10, 1933, Nazi stormtroopers organized book burnings throughout Germany. Libraries, private offices, and homes were searched for anti-Nazi and offensive materials, were transported to town squares for burning at ceremonial bonfires. On November 7, 1938, a Jewish teenager in Paris assassinated the first secretary of the German embassy. He protested unsuccessfully his parents forced deportation from Germany to Poland. This provided the excuse for the Nazis' worst pre-war pogrom, which left German streets littered with shattered glass from synagogues and store windows. It came to be known as the Kristallnacht, or Night of Broken Glass. 7,000 businesses, Jewish businesses were looted, 
901 Jews were killed, 30,000 Jews arrested and sent to concentration camps as Dachau, Buchenwald, and Sachsenhausen. Reign of terror had become a way of life for Jewish people in Germany and in Nazi-occupied countries. Hitler's original falsehood lie, along with his proclaiming to annihilate European Jewry, had yet to be transformed into reality. On July 31, 1941, Hermann Goering, a ranking Nazi policy maker, dispatched a memo to Reinhard Heydrich, an inveterate anti-Semitic functionary, quote, I herewith instruct you to make all necessary preparations in regards to organizational, financial, and military matters with a total solution of the Jewish question within the area of German influence in Europe. Hitler's unrelenting hatred of Jews, his recurring rhetoric about the annihilation of the Jewish race, quote, had come full circle. Superschweinehund Reinhard Heinrich, in charge of implementing the final solution, convened a conference at a stately mansion in the affluent suburb of Berlin at Wannsee, formerly the residence of a wealthy Jewish family which was expropriated by the Nazis. Mass shootings of Jews in, East, in the East were commonplace. Gassing of Jews had already started in December of 1941. Thus, the Wannsee Conference did not initiate the final solution, it rather was used to orchestrate it. The conference was originally scheduled for December 10th, 1941, but it was postponed because of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, resulting in America's declaring war on Japan, a country that was Germany's ally their treaty with Japan prompted the Germans to declare war on the United States on December 11, 1941. The attending 15 ranking officials in the SS, a murderous Nazi security force, and key German ministries were all aware of deportations and killings already in progress. The participants stated their views enthusiastically and were generally in agreement with the basic annihilation plan as presented by Heydrich. These Schweinehunde who planned, ate, drank, and joked at this notorious meeting were neither uneducated nor uninitiated in mass executions. Nine of these Schweinehunde had either MD or PhD degrees. Others had advanced academic honors and awards. As the Jewish specialist of the SS, Adolf Eichmann, at the conference received the task of implementing the outlines or the protocol of the final solution. With utmost bureaucratic efficiency, he organized the technical aspects of the extermination policy, from roundups, train convoys, to devising gassing procedures and setting death quotas in extermination camps, Eichmann asserted that he performed his duties with all the fanaticism that an old Nazi would expect of himself. He found his duty fascinating, admitting doing it will give him un common joy." Unquote. Eichmann found his reward for his duty at the end of a rope for committing crimes against humanity on May 31, 1962 in Israel. This Schweinehund was the first and only person in world history 
to ever be convicted of a crime that was not a crime when the act was committed and sentenced by a country that did not exist when the crime was perpetrated. Let me say this again. Eichmann was the first and only person in world history to ever be convicted of a crime that was not a crime when the act was committed and sentenced by a country that did not exist when the crime was perpetrated. The historic conference venue was the long mahogany wood meeting table seen as a boy while visiting the mansion with my parents. Originally, this venue was used for planning investments or final financial objectives, yet transformed by Nazis for planning the genocide of European Jewry. Full agreement was sealed with looted bottles of French cognac, which we know as brandy. To historians of the Nazi area, Wannsee is a grand mansion of melancholy grandeur, still standing. Fascinatingly, the foundation of both, mansion and Holocaust, were laid in the same year, 1914. The villa acquired a Senator history to culminate at 11 o'clock in the morning on the 20th January of 1942. In 2012, the Wanzi Mansion stands as a symbol of the most evil plot human beings have themselves perpetrated against civilization. Euphemistic thought it was the language of the Wanzi Conference Protocol, sanctioned the industrialization of death. Shooting and gassing experience was put into practical use in six major killing centers operational on Polish soil. Belzec, Sobibor, Treblinka, Majdanek, Auschwitz-Birkenau, as well as Helmdl. At each place, gas chambers using carbon monoxide, other using cyclone B, annihilated Jewish lives. On August 28, 1942, World Jewish Congress President Rabbi Stephen S. Wise received a cable from Swiss World Jewish Congress Representative Gerhard Riegner regarding the final solution. Rabbi Wise met with Jewish leaders and President Roosevelt to discuss the plight of European Jews on December 8, 1942. He had placed high hopes in President Roosevelt. Sadly, Wise's pleas were largely ignored. Rabbi Wise and other Jewish leaders' effort to help Nazi victims fell on deaf ears. In the end, no help reached the victims because of marginal interest among non-Jews and the Roosevelt administration. In a tragic abrogation of responsibility and intervention, the international community abandoned European Jews to their fate at the Nazi hands of the Nazis. Dr. Eli Wiesel writes in David Wyman's book, Abandonment of the Jews, Roosevelt's politics was only part of the problem. The rest had to do with the anti-Semitic mood at that time. He discloses further the Congress's unequivocal opposition to increased immigration. The Christian churches near silence, the press burial of news of the death factories in the back pages of their newspapers. It was all very clear. This generous country closed its doors and its heart to European Jewry. The most destructive rationalization was the fear that special action for the Jews would expand anti-Semitism, writes David S. Wyman in his book. The assertion was that such action would invite charges that the war was being fought for the Jews. 
Roosevelt did almost nothing for rescue because he feared the label Jew deal as opposed to New Deal. He feared the accusation that he was pro-Jewish. European Jews were not Americans. They also were not English. It was their particular misfortune only to be foreigners, but also to be Jews. Ladies and gentlemen, in the next 10 to 15 years, we, the survivors, the eyewitnesses of man's inhumanity to man, derived from an insipid, inane falsehood, incessantly repeated and drummed into every facet of government and society in Germany, resulting in a systematic and savage annihilation of European Jews in the 20th century, will fade into history. Remembering the tragedy of all tragedy will fall upon the second generation of survivors. Mr. Simon Wiesenthal, my personal mentor, provides the legacy in his book, Justice, Not Vengeance, for Future Generations. On one of his lighter moments, he diffused a controversy by a speaker who accused him of dining on Nazis for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mr. Wiesenthal replied, I'm sorry, that's not true. I don't eat pork. <laughs> Mr. Wiesenthal writes, survival is the privilege which entails obligations. I am forever asking what can I do for those who have not survived? He answers, is to be their mouthpiece, to keep their memory alive so that the dead live on in memory. Survivors also have an obligation to future generations. Our experiences must be passed on to them. Information is defense. It is not enough that the evil has already been recorded in books. Books, unlike persons, cannot be asked questions. A witness must be a live witness. At meetings I have urged, he states, you have children, you have grandchildren, your neighbors have children. You must talk with them and must talk to them. You must tell what what you experienced and provoke their questions so they can pass on your story. Only in oral accounts does memory stay alive. Mr. Wiesenthal states further, I have given lectures at universities in the US and Canada. I've talked to well-dressed, well-nourished, cheerful young students. <clears throat> who have, uh, suddenly I ask myself, how can I make a person who has never in life experienced hunger or cold understand what a piece of bread, a slice of a turnip, or a jacket meant then? How can I communicate to someone who knows death only from newspapers what a person feels like when he sees smoke rise from the crematoria, knowing that the greasy, sickly smell comes from the persons who were walking down the camp street in a long column. With what words can I communicate the stench, communicate it so it produces nausea, which emanates from a cattle car in which dead persons have stood among living for a week, unable to fall, for there was not enough space. Can I communicate what I was feeling as I stood at the edge of a pit in which there were already hundreds of dead and in which I would have lain if, if a ludicrous accident had not interrupted the executions? This is unquote from Mr. Wiesenthal. I fear that it is impossible to communicate these experiences. 
We can shape our memories into words, but these words do not become the reality in the listener's mind again. What happened in the final solution is beyond one's power of imagination. We are obligated to make young people realize how unique, unbelievable, and exceptional our experiences were. But by this attempt, we made it difficult for them to accept our accounts as truth or fact. The incomprehensible remains incomprehensible, quoted by Mr. Wiesenthal. We can do nothing other than decide that life goes on. It is probably impossible to live with the continuous awareness of 50 million war dead, six, of them, six million of them Jews. Otherwise, one would go out of his mind. And yet, it seems to me just as weird that only a few decades afterwards, one can act as though that mountain of corpuses never existed. Remembering must include the righteous among nations, a title derived from the Talmud to describe Gentiles who risked their lives to save others. Individuals such as Oskar Schindler, Raoul Wallenberg, Meep Gies, and even nations as Denmark risked safety and security to save Jewish persons persecuted by the Nazis. Risking torture and death, these righteous few bear witness that soft voices of conscience could still be heard over Nazis' rhetoric of barbarous racism. The righteous among nations save not only individuals, but as the Talmud states, the entire universe. Nazi resistance fighters, severely wounded German army colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, planted a bomb to assassinate Hitler on the 20th of July, 1944, at a field headquarters to end a futile war to end dehumanized genocide, end the ruthless Nazi dictatorship, to reestablish a democratic representative German government. The assassination plan failed. Von Stauffenberg was shot the same evening, and his supporters were hanged by wire, dying the most painful, torturous deaths. Today, the Wanze Mansion stands as a silent monolith memorializing an obscure, abominable conference of Nazi party functionaries replete with academic achievement and honors, who truculently and savagely resolved the final solution. Seven decades passed, yet anti-Semitism remains rampant as in the past. In these United States, anti-Semitism is alive and well in San Francisco. There, they wanted to pass a male genital mutilation bill through the ballot. If it had passed, circumcision, a ritual Jewish and Muslim tradition, would be banned. A superior court judge struck the proposal from the ballot. Anti-Semites were promoting their cause by publishing materials with sinister-looking rabbis and a blonde superhero who rescues basic babies from undergoing circumcision. In the Middle East, the Mullah's regime of Iran unequivocally declared the denial of the Holocaust and the right for Israel to exist. Has the secular world changed its sentiment attitude towards anti-Semitism and Israel? I think very little, if not at all. Monuments and books are changeless, mute reminders of the infinite tragedy of the 20th century. Only people can change, 
and therein lies our task. Simon Wiesenthal concludes profoundly, what happened in the final solution is beyond one's power of imagination. The incomprehensible remains incomprehensible. In May 1945, the mansion was occupied by Soviet troops, followed by American occupation troops who used the venue as an officer's club. Allied powers began searches for Nazi documents they would need as evidence at the Nuremberg International Military Tribunal. They found tons of documents, but the order signed by Hitler, which gave authority for the genocide of the Jews, was never found. Finally, in 1947, the minutes of the 20th January, of the 20th January 1942 conference were found. Today, Tourists can stand in the very room where plans were formed for the genocide of European Jewry. The mansion has been converted to a Holocaust museum, which opened on the 50th anniversary in 1992 of the famous conference. His, to historians, the Wanzi era is a grand villa that still stands. The foundations of both buildings and Holocaust were laid in the same year, 1914. The villa was to acquire a synodal history culminating on January 20th, 1942. The Wanzi Memorial Education Center, along with numerous worldwide Holocaust memorials, bear witness to the incomprehensible dimension of evil the extreme cruelty and savagery of man's inhumanity to man. Yet after liberation, war crimes and crimes against humanity, tried by international tribunals, books, eyewitness testimony, monuments, films, audiovisual presentations, seven decades later, no significant progress in human relations, respect and dignity have occurred. Middle Eastern despotism resorts to demagoguery in denying the Holocaust and calling for destruction of the state of Israel. Again, a blatant lie, falsehood are proclaimed for ultimate acceptance of truth. Government supported racism, transformed into genocide, have occurred in Far Eastern and African nations. Mankind, the controlling factor in the equation remained unchanged. Education, I strongly believe, can progress or ameliorate human thought and conduct. Nonetheless, education internationally must be replete with comprehensive knowledge of the humanities, language, and communication. We need to expand a learning of American and world history if we don't know where we have been, how do we know where we are going, is my question. These studies will facilitate cultural exchanges and offer tolerance to human rights, honor, and dignity. We must restrict our familiar use of euphemisms and political correctness. These practices and uses distort and mitigate the full impact of a lie or a falsehood. It gives the bigot, the demagogue, the desired advantage in winning support for his bigotry, intolerance leading to catastrophic realities. The Nazis were experts in the use of euphemisms. Schweinehund Josef Goebbels was a master of it in his hateful and bigoted oratory to convince and win the support of German people for the Nazi terror and the final solution of European Jewry. Evidence of subliminal creeping presence of anti-Semitism in our beloved country, as expressed in California, attempting to make circumcision illegal and expressed by 
protesters in the occupation of Wall Street, demonstrations as subliminal and inconsequential as they may seem, they can be compared to the insidious four-page missive written by Hitler in 1919 documenting his, his hate-based anti-Semitism ending in World War II, costing 50 million lives. The German writer and poet and social critic Heinrich Heine commented in 1856, a nation or society which burns its books will burn its buildings and ultimately burn its people. Devastating prophecies transformed into reality at the Wanzi Conference on January 20th, 1942. Thank you for coming. Thank you for learning. I am sure. I am sure, I am sure there are some questions and probably some details that I have omitted. Feel free to ask questions and somebody with a microphone will come because I can't hear you down there. <laughs> you hear me? I can hear you, yes. You can hear me, that's good. In defense of President Franklin Delano what? In defense of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I just want to make a statement and then I have a question. My statement is this, the German-American Bund in this country was far, far more superior and hateful than the folks in San Francisco and the, and the uh, Problem. So I that's would, the reason for Roosevelt's reaction or lack of reaction. That's to right. St. Louis Probably so, yes, yes, yes. My question is this, yeah. how, I'd I like your, your take on the fact that the German media, the news media, didn't do anything. And the German courts were corrupt, so corrupt, that innocent people were sent to the gas chambers and so forth. Uh, oh yes, I, <clears throat> I, agree with, I agree with your uh, observation. I would also say this, they could have, they could have militarily done something to the transports of the of the people that they had rounded up to the extermination centers. Uh, my wife uh, survived the round-the-clock bombardments of Berlin. In other words, not only industrial um, targets were hit, but also residential targets were hit. Yet, yet, the tracks from the stations of roundup were left in place. They thought it was not a military objective. No, it wasn't. But they could have done something and had they, yes, the tracks could be repaired. I agree with that too. But if you make round the clock bombardments, make round the clock bombardments on something that prevents further destruction of a, of a minority, it wasn't done. And I think the reason why it wasn't done is the ones that I listed, because the uh, plight fell on deaf ears and they were afraid that what they would, would have done if they would have executed that, that uh, manu maneuver, that they were doing it for the Jews and not for anything else. And this prevented a lot of, let's say, um, uh, uh, positive action. On, and the churches, the churches were silent too. There was no objection to it. The churches let it go on. I will say to you this. Cardinal Eugene Pacelli was the papal nuncio representing the Vatican in Germany under the Weimar Republic when it was a republic and under the Nazis. Yet he did not speak out. He did not. He was a nuncio, means a representative, a, um, like, a, like Hillary Clinton is a representative of the United States in, in foreign lands. He could have done something. Or the Pope, Pius XI at that time, 
could have said something. They were quiet. They didn't, do, they didn't say anything. So, when Cardinal Eugene Pacelli became pope in 1939, that same scenario continued. The churches did not raise any issues and knew the incidents that I have listed. The um, burning of the books, the uh, Kristallnacht, the burning of the all these, these, these programs, it didn't move them to say anything. Bystanders, that's it. Yes, ma'am. I want to make two comments for folks who might be interested more in the details of the Vansi Conference itself. Although it is a reenactment, and there are some who might disagree, um, the movie, I think it might have been an HBO presentation, called Conspiracy with Kenneth Branagh, and it is available at the Sarasota Library. It's called Conspiracy with, Santa, with uh, Kenneth Branagh. Um, it's chilling, and it details the conference itself. And I do want to just make one comment. I about the churches at large. Um, I may commend also a particular book, some might disagree with it, uh, about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and called Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Prophet, and Spy by Eric Metaxas, M-E-T-E-X-A-S. So, but maybe by and large, folks did nothing, but there were certainly individuals who tried. That's right. Uh, my name is Edie Jacobs. I'm a child survivor of the Holocaust. And I, and I have a question for this group and for all other people, Jews, who are survivors or non-survivors who want the Jewish people to live. Why are there no young people or not enough young people in this room today? Where are the young people? We have a Jewish school here. Why aren't they asked to come to this meeting? Because other, other, um, other things in this world are of more interest and more rewarding. It isn't their world, it is the past. Uh, they might see a, uh, or read an article that will take maybe 15, min 15 minutes to half an hour to read, and then it is discarded. I have made an effort, I have made an effort and the um, Manatee County uh, school system as well as Sarasota school system do have a program where we go into the classrooms and talk to the damn people. But they don't come in voluntarily. They are herded into a room, listen to it because their teacher tells them that they need to know it. The initiative isn't there. Reason, but this, I, I have two sons, I've been a mother-in-law five times, only two of those brides were Jewish. And th this country is not an anti-Semitic country. We have a law on the books that was uh, signed by Lyndon Johnson in 1964. The Jews, and I, I believe in 50 years or, or less, will be physically assimilated in this country. No, it's know. happening. May, may I just say, I mean, we're all sort of blending together, but maybe those who, there are some people here, uh, maybe those who are under 30 could stand up to make some people feel a little bit better. <laughs> under 40, perhaps. Yes, sir. Okay, see, see? Okay. Yes, a few of our Berlin-born friends have been invited uh, in the last few years back to Berlin by the current or recent German government. My question is, have you ever been back since you left? Yes, sir. And uh, <coughs> you might just say a few words about when and what your experience was in returning. I've been back because, sev I, well, several reasons I've been back. First of all, my wife is born in Berlin. And as I told you in my presentation that she went through the round-the-clock bombardment, uh, and she at that time had her mother-in-law still alive. Her, her father was euthanized by the Nazis because he had, a, according to them, an incurable disease, and so uh, she visited her mother on frequent occasions. Yes, 
I was invited by the Berlin Senate as a former um, uh, uh, resident of Berlin, and I was invited to speak to a young group, to a young group. The questions, as we uh, had opened them uh, at the end of the talk, were very, let's say, thoughtful questions. They couldn't understand either why it was the, uh, the, the, the decision to kill innocent people for a religion that had nothing to do with any crime or anything else. The, the incomprehensible of, this, of the Nazi regime, based on that insipid lie, is still an incomprehensible problem to them. To, and I would say also this, the um, young kids. I visited um, um, the um, house of Anne Frank in Amsterdam. Well, we were in Amsterdam and we wanted to see the house where she was hiding for several years. And Miep Gies, who I mentioned, protected them from the, from the uh, Dutch um, Nazis. We couldn't get in the building. There were buses from, from uh, Holland, buses from Belgium, buses from Germany, buses from um, uh, uh, France, scheduled classes going into the building and seeing what she went through and how she kept her diary. So the youth of Europe, I would say, are, I think, a little bit even more informed than our youth here. I guess the problem was a little closer to them, geographically maybe, I don't know, or maybe the effort on part of their parents and their teachers enforced and reminded them when occasions came up to think about it and reflect on it. Maybe that is a reason. Our parents don't enforce it. And our teachers, well, yes, it is a, it is a state law, it was passed in 1994, that the Holocaust must be taught in the public school system. Yes, we go there and we tell them the story. And they, give, they, they send you uh, thank you letters for these students because they never heard what we had, what we tell them. It is so removed, so remote, that they have a difficulty, as I pointed out, to believe. Is this really truth? Is this really a fact? Or is he expanding on something that really was of minor consequence? That still exists in the minds of some youngsters. Yes, ma'am. Another subject. I hope you will clarify for me your reference to the Occupy Wall Street and its relate. You use the, a, a comparison with well, the Nazis. Well, let me say this to you. I, let I me say this to you. If you have watched the, the occupiers, I heard a youngster of, well, maybe of a freshman or a, or a sophomore saying to the interviewer from a, a network, it's the Jews that have the money that don't let us, that cause this problem. She expressed that. I heard that. Well, that was one person, right? Whether it's one person, well, they, they happen to catch one. If there's one, there's others. That is the Wall Street occupiers. I don't know how, how strong the, the anti-Semitic stance is by them, but it gave me enough, again, because of the basic lies, small things that are... That, 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 that increase over time and make catastrophes possible. That is my view of it. Yes? Uh, I'm going to just mention to any of you here in the room to, today who have children or grandchildren who may be in high school, whether it's here in Sarasota, Florida, or anywhere else around the country, there is an organization known as the March of the Living. And in the mid to early 1980s, we lived in Boca Raton, Florida, and our rabbi found out about the first March of the Living that would take place at that time. 
And he asked my son, Danny Levison, who now lives here in Sarasota and is on our board of uh, directors here at the temple, he asked my son Dan and another boy at our synagogue in Boca Raton to submit a letter if they could go to the March of the Living. And Danny and this, his friend were both accepted to go. About 200 children and adults were going to make this two and a half, I can't even remember, three week trip. And it went to Poland, it went to um, Russia, it went to Poland, Germany, uh, a couple of other places in Europe. Uh, they saw all of, they saw all of the, um, not all, but many of the, uh, the camps. And it was very sad. And after, to end this uh, two and a half, three week trip, they ended in Israel for about four or five days. And it was a phenomenal, unbelievable experience. When Danny and his friend came back, got off the plane and wherever we were, we were in Boca at the time, and I said to him, well, what did you think? He said, Mom, I can't talk about it now. I just can't address what went on. When he went back to school, he was in high school at the time, about 16 or 17, and two or three of his teachers and his student friends knew where he had gone. And his teacher said, Danny, could you do us a favor and write up a, a script or something and come and talk to us at the high school in Boca? He said, okay. He wrote up a paper. He talked to quite a few classes, and the news got around the city. And within that year, in the 1980s, Danny spoke to 40 different groups, children, B'nai Brit, B'nai El, B'nai Brit, women's groups, all kinds of organizations, and it was a phenomenal experience. So if any of them, they are still doing every year, and our temple knows when there will be the next March of the Living, pay, find out about what you'd have to do to get your, your, your children or your grandchildren and send them there. They will never forget it the rest of their lives. And let me, let me also uh, add to that. The daughter of our projectionist, Miss, <coughs> Miss Sarah Ida Tenesco, is also a member of the uh, Walking of the Living. If you are a recipient of the uh, Jewish News pu published by the Federation, this young lady has explicitly told her experiences when she went to, um, to uh, Auschwitz and then went to Israel to be part of the visitations at Yad Vashem. Yes, that is true. Miss, uh, sadly, she's not here today, but she, is a, she made that trip as well. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Mr. Sir. Mr. Library, getting back to some of these uh, military versus political decisions by the FDR and the administration, maybe even Churchill. It seems to me that FDR and Churchill could have released at least a half a squadron of B-17s uh, from either England or from our North African or Italian bases and perhaps could have taken out some of those tracks leading into those concentration camps. Yes was, did Roosevelt actually uh, commit himself to say to the Jewish uh, representatives if they communicated with them that we cannot do it because it's, uh, well, it's impossible? They or? considered the tracks not a military objective and didn't want to risk planes and, uh, and resources to that activity. It wasn't important to them. They bombed residential areas in Berlin. Now, why was that important? That's not a military objective. Yet they did not go to the tracks and the, the roundup places and bomb them. They should bomb them around the clock. Maybe, maybe they would have found a reason of utility that they couldn't move the trains anymore. Maybe it would have stopped it. I don't know. You never know how these despots think and what, what makes sense to them and what doesn't make sense to them. Are those uh, targets, those camps, within range of our London uh, and Italian bases? Yes, they bases? were. Yes, they were. It was uh, Krakow, for example, uh, Auschwitz, is not far, at that time, 
well, it's now farther away because they, they lost territory to the Polish government. At that time, it wasn't far. They, we could have reached them. We could have done it. Was Roosevelt and Churchill quoted by saying uh, these are not military well, targets? Whether it was, was there done, documentation? Whether it was done underhandedly or openly, it just wasn't done. It wasn't done. He was afraid that, it, that the interpretation of using military hardware and committing uh, uh, Air Force crews to that mission, that, they, that he is supporting the war or, or leading a war for the Jews and not for the Allied causes. That's probably what governed this whole decision. He did not want to be known as a supporter of the Jews. Well, the World Jewish Congress, the World Jewish Congress was the only one at that time, I think, that could have expressed some, some, uh, or, or made it a little forceful to them, but it, they didn't get anywhere. They didn't get it. It was a futile attempt by Rabbi Wise, who led the World Jewish Congress, to persuade the third Roosevelt administration to do something about it. And when, we, when they knew about the, um, the camps that were already established in the 30s, it didn't, it didn't change their minds either. They knew the true facts. The reports were there. What went on? Uh, like A cold to... ignorance. Yes, sir? Comment. It's not entirely Roosevelt's purview. Huh? Uh, to make those decisions, I think it's well known that the State Department was extremely anti-Semitic. We have a friend, Herman Morgenthau's son, who lived in Rhode Island, who gave us some talks about his father and his father's unwillingness to expose uh, and to bring Judaism into the political arena. Not true. He knew the anti-Semitic anti-Semitism that existed. The War Department was not friendly with the Jews. It was so Roosevelt is not entirely to blame for the inactivity that took place. He has to concede to his advisors and in a time of stress. I also like to address your criticism about the round-the-clock bombing of Berlin. It did serve a purpose, and that is to destroy the morale of the German people. The same reason that Hitler was using to bomb residences and um, in in London was to destroy morale. Now that's, that's a legitimate uh, military um, action. And we do it ourselves, uh, even in our work in this last um, military expedition in Libya, just to bomb civilian supporters of Saddam Hussein uh, in order to destroy morale. So it's a question, it's a question of using military resources and uh, the, what result would come from that, and your point was well made, that bombing railroad lines uh, are not a very effective military activity. Bombing military railroad installations are, and they were heavily bombed. Sir, I don't think it's a question of being effective or ineffective. You need to do something rather than do nothing. That is the point. That is the point. This um, presentation today is important. It's important that we hear it. We know what happened. We don't understand it. We'll never understand how it could have happened. Right. When, I, when I was in Vance in 2006, I saw a document that absolutely, as horrendous as I knew everything was, just made my blood run cold. And through a friend, I was, uh, I was told I couldn't have a copy, but through a friend from England, he was back there again and sent me a copy of this that says, profit accounting by the SS of use of detainees in concentration camps. And it talks about the daily average lease income because these people were leased and they, they, made, uh, they had an income from the work of the people that they arrested. It was, they got six, they paid six dollars a Reichsmark for each person, less the food for the day was 60 cents, 60 rice marks. 
lest the clothing, which was amortized, was 10 rice marks. Average life expectancy of each detainee was nine months. Nine months at 270 days at 5.3 Reichsmarks meant the income was 1,431 Reichsmarks for the life of that person in the concentration camp. Reasonable return of value of the body. First, gold teeth. Second, clothing third valuable items, and fourth money, less the cost to them of cremation was only two Reichsmarks. Their average net profit was 200 Reichsmarks. So total profit after nine months that the, that the people lived was 1,631 Reichsmarks, plus there was additional income from the value of bones and ashes. Could that well, make you sick? Well, <coughs> those, those atrocities, I generalized on them, but you're right. It, uh, they profited from the, <coughs> from the industrialization of death. The uh, Nazis profited and, I guess, financed the war and financed the other persecution attempts. I thank you for coming. Um, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Oh, oh, we do have, oh. Well, then let me, let me walk you through it. I can't see it from here, let me see. All right, oh, we got it. Hold on a minute. Okay, here you see a geographic cut of the location of the, of the building. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Berlin, you see in the center, and we lived, I would say, where the number three is where we um, <coughs> lived uh, uh, before 1938. We often took a train from Berlin, a uh, regional, uh, uh, train or the subway, and it went right close to the Wannsee. The word See is the German word for lake, okay? And one, I don't know, they use that, that's the name of somebody, and that uh, combination uh, became uh, known as the Greater Wannsee. That's it. Now you see a close up. <clears throat> Many a days I spent with, on the upper right hand corner, that white spot, that is the, um, that's open to the public. That was the um, beach at the lake, and around the lake you had all kinds of yachting and boating and swimming clubs, and it was an upscale community where you had big buildings with, uh, with lo lots of acreage and so forth. The top little arrow, the top one, the little box, points to the left, that is where the mansion stood and is still standing, right there. In other words, on the western shore of the lake, facing the, um, uh, the upscales community on the other side and the public beaches. This is the building. This is the actual front of the building. It's an enormous mansion. That's what it looks like today. That's what they chose to have their meeting. Now, the, to your left, to your left, the three big windows where you see those little chairs standing, those are the windows facing the lake. That is the room in which they sat and decided in 85 minutes the final solution, which incidentally is a euphemism for genocide. Final solution, the word you can have a final solution that could be positive or whatever. They used it to hide what they really meant by it. They meant genocide. This is the view that they saw while attending the meeting. They chose the, the best room of the house and facing the lake, and that is what it looks like today. This is a memorial plaque that, uh, um, that that depicts the actual conference on top, the date, and on the bottom, the
the um, people who suffered as, as a result of that conference of the Jewish uh, people who were actually part of that community. Here you see a layout of the building, of the mansion. In the upper right-hand area, number six, the Wanzi Conference, there, that is the room where they sat with the three win four windows facing the lake. You now have other rooms where you have uh, special exhibitions and um, documents and um, uh, memorabilia uh, that are housed in the, there's a special room that just deals with Auschwitz on the upper left-hand corner where it says 10 and right next to it is the life in a concentration camp. So it gives a complete, a complete overview of what took place in Germany under the Nazis. That is when you walk into the mansion, right on right the entrance hall, leading to the back, to the lakefront area, to the uh, particular thing. Well, in those days, there was no central heating, so they had... Oh, okay. Here you see, <clears throat> from the entrance hall, the uh, document center to the left and to the right, where you go further down in the back, you see a, a, a faint outline of the table, which is, of course, not in existence anymore, but it is a exhibition um, table where they sat and where they held a meeting. Here you have a close-up. Here you have a close-up of the meeting room. This is where the table stood, the mahogany table that I saw. Uh, I guess uh, either the Nazis removed it during their time when they needed firewood to heat the building, or when the Soviets came in, Soviets have a habit of either taking things and shipping it home, breaking it up, or, um, uh, uh, or, or misusing it or abusing it. Anyway, the table doesn't exist anymore, and here you see a close-up of the table, and on the right-hand side, on the right-hand side you see pictures of the 15 Schweinhunde that sat around that particular table. You, there's a, Another picture which shows you a little closer. This is another view, and there it is again. There it is again. There are the 15 Nazis that took part in it with their biographies on the left and on the right-hand side. Can we go back to that once more? I want to point out something. Okay, here we have a close-up of them. The second man on the left-hand side on top was the conference leader. That is Heinrich, uh, uh, Reinhard Heydrich, who led the conference, okay? He was assassinated by uh, Czechoslovakian partisans uh, the same year in the spring, and as a result of that uh, assassination, the entire population of the village of Lidice was uh, murdered. Further down, further down, all the way down on the left-hand side, you see the biggest Schweinehund of them all. That is Eichmann. There he is in his Nazi uniform. He led the protocol. It was, as I pointed out, a, with the highest efficiency that he could muster, he had common joy in doing what he did. And he's the one who um, was captured in, in, um, in uh, Argentina, brought to Israel, stand trial, and was hanged in um, Jerusalem. That, I guess, is it. You had a picture before of the... Okay.